The year was approximately 950 AD, and Emperor Constantine VII's elite Varangian Guard retained as his private defense force in what seems to have been practically a timeless tradition of virtually all Roman, Germanic, but also Persian and Indian and Greek peoples and beyond, stretching back to the dawn of recorded history, took their positions to do their famous, quote, Gothic dance. We don't know a great deal of details, but the dance is said to have involved two circles of warriors, one inside the other, moving in opposite directions. Some of the warriors were said to have worn animal skins or masks, while others carried spears or swords, all spurred onward by a periodic and rhythmic chant of Tui, meaning victory in Old Norse. It's said to have both frightened and fascinated all those looking on. What was likely an ancient pre-battle ritual and a display of martial prowess and a proactive honoring of the ancestors now served the dual purpose of allowing these elite warriors to retain a sense of identity and culture in largely foreign lands as they spread across the vast majority of the civilized world. It allowed them to retain a sense of connection to the root, no matter how far they might travel in time and space. These greatest and most proficient of all warriors had a strong connection not just to the Norse and the Vikings, but to their renowned berserkers in particular. They also, obviously, had a connection to the Goths. The Goths, in turn, were said to have been largely indistinguishable from the Vandals, who, in turn, were said to be essentially indistinguishable from the Alans or the Alani. The Alans were said to have the closest connections with the Scytho-Sarmatian peoples and the Germanic Suebi, who, in turn, had the closest connection with the Franks and Lombards. I could go on like this with ease and off the top of my head for 20 to 30 minutes, unabated. The point being that what seems to have been one massive family of peoples has since become something akin to a people with 100 names. A people who academics and modern historians studiously labor to break and factionalize into ever smaller shards. Which can be helpful, in a sense. Being able to hear the more specific history of a branch of people is informative and valuable. But it's come at the cost of our beginning to miss the forest for the trees. Of our beginning to no longer see the multitude of points of interconnectedness genetically, culturally, linguistically, spiritually, and slowly but surely, it's begun to lead us all into a profound misunderstanding of history. When looking at the vast expanse of human history, the only way to understand it with clarity is to learn, at least to some degree, to view it in the manner that the ancients did. If we take our borders of the present day, our racial groupings or cultural groupings of the present day, and attempt to superimpose these on those peoples who lived in the same regions in distant times, we'll gradually develop the most confusing and convoluted picture as a result. Similarly, if we take our modern politically correct mindset and use this as a prism through which we view history, we'll inevitably experience a similar confusion. One of the things I try to do is speak to ancient times as they were experienced by the ancients, insofar as I'm able. Only when I began to do this did things begin to make some real sense to me. Only then did various puzzle pieces that had initially baffled me begin to fit together and begin to form something of a cohesive whole. I've come to believe more and more strongly with the passage of time that the peoples comprising the Indo-European language group, those we've alternately referred to as Aryans or Yamnaya, even Scythians by some historians at various points in time, were once essentially a single family who would go on to spread very far and wide and gradually come to forget, perhaps even be helped to forget, this common heritage. Though there seem to have been great efforts to avoid forgetting, and I suspect this is one of the reasons why so many of the very oldest documents we possess focus so heavily on bloodline, 
lineage, and ancestry. Great kings and heroes across vast stretches of time and space so often traced their lineage to the same figures. Of course, today we've taken to claiming that these figures were their, quote, gods, and merely legendary and mythological. But the ancients seem to speak of them as flesh and blood heroes. Yes, descended from a royal lineage of lowercase g gods, if you will. But this term, god, seems to be used far differently today than it was in these distant ages. Their own practice seemed something akin to extreme ancestor veneration, more so than what we today think of as religious worship. One of the reasons adopting this framework proved so incredibly helpful is that this subset that claimed the most direct descent from these gods seemed to be, more often than not, immensely capable men who traveled and migrated across the world to a degree and at a scale that modern academics now claim would have been impossible, despite overwhelming evidence proving them wrong in the most clear, direct, and matter-of-fact ways. The Alans, or Alani, people are just one fascinating example of a great many. Closely connected to the Vandals, and in fact often following them to distant locales, apparently due to the Vandals having a greater degree of dynastic royal blood, this one people could be found everywhere from the westernmost point of Europe to Persia, modern Turkey, and even, in later times, making up the elite royal guardsmen of the greatest Mongol rulers. The Vandals, too, a people nearly identical to the Goths with regard to ethnicity and in many cultural respects, could be found everywhere from North Africa to the Byzantine Empire, and many argue with traces all the way into China and Far East Asia, at least of incredibly kindred and closely related relatives. In short, the three key points that help bring history to life and create some logical and rational and coherent picture are, firstly, the understanding that there was an immense amount of movement and migration of peoples, especially the most capable and successful of them. Secondly, that these most successful made up something of an aristocratic caste that were subjugators and rulers and governors over a great portion of the entire world at any given time. And thirdly, the understanding that the lion's share of this spread of peoples was very similar to what moderns have come to call colonialism, orchestrated by a largely seafaring people who first seemed to create vast trade networks and later helped spark the rise of several nations and empires especially at the most major nodes or central hubs of these vast trade networks. Tacitus, in describing a tribe toward the northwest coast of Europe, which would appear to be in the region of Luwarden, Groningen, and Imden, tells us this. Quote, Hitherto I have been describing Germany towards the west. To the northward, it winds away with an immense compass, and first of all occurs the nation of the Chaucians, who, though they begin immediately at the confines of the Frisians and occupy part of the shore, extend so far as to border upon all of the several people whom I have already recounted, till at last, by a circuit, they reach quite to the boundaries of the Catons, a region so vast the Chaucians do not only possess, but fill, a people of all the Germans the most noble, such as would rather maintain their grandeur by justice than violence. They live in repose, retired from the broils abroad, void of avidity to possess more, free from a spirit of domineering over others. They provoke no wars, they ravage no countries, they pursue no plunder. Of their bravery and power, the chief evidence arises from hints that, without wronging or oppressing others, they are come to be superior to all. Yet they are all ready to arm, and if an exigency require, armies are presently raised, powerful and abounding as they are in men and horses. And even when they are quiet and their weapons laid aside, their credit and name continue equally high." End quote. What he seems to be referring to here is an epicenter of the larger Germanic people group, 
a root of sorts, which might be said to be best represented by those peoples who reside around Doggerland or Friesland, and certainly encompasses parts of the Netherlands, of Anglo-Saxon Britain, of Norway and Sweden, Denmark and Northern Germany, parts of Switzerland and Belgium, and whose branches seem to extend virtually everywhere, powerfully into Ireland and Scotland, making up virtually the entire population of Iceland and the Faroe Islands, on into France, Spain, Italy, Eastern Europe, stretching to the Black Sea, and in more ancient times, into the Caucasus and the Caspian, into Athens and Greece, ancient Troy, Persia, northwestern India, and into the Tarim Basin and beyond. It's important to be clear here this isn't to say that this epicenter was a superior racial subset, standing head and shoulders over those branches extending into so many other regions. After all, it's important to remember a timeless custom of these people seemed to be not just the banishment of their worst, but often the far more prevalent custom of sending out their best, especially when their domestic and local success caused such population explosions that things began to get crowded. When this occurred, many of the best and brightest and most adventurous would be periodically sent to distant shores and distant lands as colonists, conquerors, explorers, and settlers, and in some exceptional cases, even mercenary warriors, or Viking-style pirates and raiders, who, initially at least, focused these raids on foreign peoples and long-standing enemies. So when I say that they seem to be an epicenter of this larger family, what I mean is that this seems to be a subset whose culture and traditions caused them to retain the greatest degree of homogeneity, and thus continuity, and likely the lowest degree of admixture with outside peoples, both culturally and genetically. One of the great tragedies of history is that not only is virtually all of it that survives written from the perspective of Romans or Greeks, but that nearly all of the most comprehensive and informative accounts of those peoples lying outside of their borders have been either gradually misplaced or destroyed or otherwise lost over time. Or, as in the case of Cassiodorus's account of the Gothic peoples, has had to suffer through a middleman stage of translation or reinterpretation. And in the case of Jordanus's Getica, this isn't even a direct translation at all, but rather, by the author's admission, a very loose account, leaving room for profound manipulation, if this happened to be part of the goal. Much of the most incredible, fascinating, informative, and intriguing of historical accounts of this sprawling family of peoples, especially prior to around the fall of Rome, was either never jotted down and retained, or has since disappeared and it's likely that the remainder perhaps sits heavily guarded and under lock and key in sprawling Vatican archives, shut away from the public eye indefinitely. This massive void, this black hole of history, allows modern academics and historians to begin to spin their tails and weave their webs, to creatively fill in the gaps, to create a historical picture that suits modern times, modern culture, and modern sensibilities and sensitivities. It's my opinion that one of the more upsetting trends of modern scholarship has been the attempt to portray ancient peoples as both exceptionally primitive and exceptionally isolationist, to paint them as living short, brutish lives filled with fear and baseless superstition, as having difficulty even subsisting, let alone being able to travel great distances. This is one of those viewpoints that, growing up, I initially took for granted as truth, but that I've gradually become convinced couldn't possibly be more mistaken. And I feel compelled to make that case, and to speak this truth, to do whatever I'm able to help counter this trend. Of the hundreds of works tying this larger racial and cultural family of Western mankind to ancient Greece, Egypt, India, or Persia, 
the Tarim Basin or Asia, or Troy, for example. Nearly all of these are now, suddenly, in recent decades, considered frauds or forgeries, or dishonestly written to add to the prestige of this or that individual, or people, or nation, or royal house, or to supposedly manufacture a link with a biblical past, or merely to excite the reader and make for a compelling story. But the more I've learned, the more I find this tossing out of scores of our oldest historical accounts to be so unjustified as to be outright strange and suspect, especially considering how many of these passages that speak to these links to faraway lands are often short, matter-of-fact remarks from ancient historians of the widest variety of different backgrounds, and often buried within a larger work of serious and sober scholarship, as opposed to being part of some document written for a king, for example, with the obvious intent to glorify his lineage and or solidify his reign. I wouldn't want to suggest this invention of history never happens, of course, in more narrow, specific, and exceptional cases, I've seen evidence that it has, and I think the motives behind the pinning of any historical works should always be strenuously questioned. I even have my reservations about Jordanus' work on the Goths. But I often feel like we're constantly faced with the choice to either believe what our ancestors said about themselves, or to believe what modern scholars claim about our ancestors. Namely, that their own scholars and historians were nearly all liars, exaggerators, or simply stupid and confused. Despite the fact that they were far closer to these major events in both time and space, and of course that they were existing within cultures that still had living traditions passed down through the generations that stemmed directly back to these prior times and major events. Moreover, most of them had no discernible motives to lie. It simply doesn't make sense to my mind. And the amount of material we have to throw out in order to believe this newly forming modern conception is significant, to put it mildly. In this video, I'd like to discuss the topic of the genetic, cultural, linguistic, and spiritual connections between the branches of this larger family tree and present a case as to why there is a great deal more connectivity than modern academia and scholarship seems willing to admit. And I'd like to try to present a picture of how these peoples seemed to see themselves, namely as a familial hierarchy, or even dynasty, that gradually spread its wings across most of the world as opposed to how modern academics are attempting to aggressively reinterpret and reframe this past. Where they attempt to break apart and show every conceivable contrast and difference, in this video, I will instead attempt to unify and speak to the striking similarities and beyond coincidence commonalities. In an attempt to simplify and clarify, I'd like to focus on a handful of key points, starting from the root language of Proto-Indo-European that seems to lie at, or very near, the central and starting point of our great journey as a people, and acts as some of the best evidence of this interconnectedness. But also, some ubiquitous events and storylines and themes that continually recur across numerous myths and traditions and legends of our varied people groups across India, Persia, ancient Sumer, the Norse and Germanic peoples, the Celts and the earliest Britons, all the way to biblical accounts. I've come to believe, strongly, that when variations of a single story pervade this many cultures and traditions, there's almost certainly a seed of truth to them and that it's only in bringing these core elements together, piecing these puzzle pieces together, that we might hope to make some real sense of things. The creation, the paradise, the flood myth, the great progenitor or patriarch figure, the mountain on which the gods are said to have resided, the giants or titans, the mixing of gods with men, etc. 
Again, whereas modern academia seems obsessively focused on spotting the differences and contrasts, my own goal will be to speak to the commonalities across all of these traditions, an attempt to show that not only do we likely represent a singular family, but that this singular family seems to have had a relatively singular history stretching back far enough. A history that obliterates the modern conventional model of these completely disparate and unconnected civilizations supposedly springing up in relative isolation, whose incredible similarities might be explained away as mere coincidence or fluke. A technical term often used for my viewpoint here is hyperdiffusionism, a term I would define as the recognition that a single tree of related peoples spread across the majority of the world and is responsible for most of the languages we speak today, the bulk of the innovations and technical achievements of the past, the majority of the monuments and structures still extant, stretching from South America to China and beyond. And it's often paired with the idea that this singular people may ultimately be a remnant of another civilization that seems to have been largely destroyed as a result of massive cataclysm. And this hyper-diffusionist perspective is one that's been rejected more and more aggressively in the post-World War II era, in large part, I would suggest, due to its being politically incorrect. This singular history helps explain countless things modern historians both fail to explain and thus choose to completely ignore. The massive mining operations in places like North America in ancient times, the striking similarity of both construction methods and resulting structures across the world, the discovery of a certain out-of-place genetic type of human being in the most far-flung locations where they're not meant to have lived, and the worldwide spread of the branches of a single Proto-Indo-European root language and its derivatives and branches, among so many other things. Firstly, let's discuss the topic of language. Sanskrit is a fascinating language, and a language that very likely lies nearer to the root of the Proto-Indo-European language spoken before this tree branched off throughout the entire world than nearly any other surviving tongue. The oral tradition of Sanskrit-speaking peoples was remarkably similar to the Bardic tradition and that the most important stories and worthwhile histories and myths and legends and tales would be memorized and voiced by an exceptional individual who'd been trained to carry out precisely this task from his earliest days, at times memorizing massive songs or stories or myths, and not just the words, but their particular manner of delivery, including tone, cadence, intonation, pacing, in their wisdom and foresight, these traditions even created certain rhythm and structure to the speech or song, seemingly to make it easier to remember exceedingly long texts or songs, but also far harder to corrupt or change them in any way, to ensure it would be handed down, essentially intact and unchanged, across the generations, so that a child may be hearing the exact same song or tale as his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. This cultural lineage has been broken, of course, in our day, though perhaps not irrevocably so, thankfully, though this is a topic for another time. Countless great thinkers from prior ages marveled at just how strangely familiar Sanskrit felt in comparison to their own European tongues with many, especially German scholars, hailing it as possessing an exceptional purity and power, clarity and cleanliness. Of course, this was the same language spoken by the Aryan peoples that swept into India, ultimately responsible for authoring what seemed to be some of the oldest works in our tradition, such as the Rig Veda. But it may surprise you to know the wealth of connections between Sanskrit and modern Lithuanian. Lithuanian is considered to be the closest living sister language of Sanskrit, and it's apparently preserved many features of Proto-Indo-European that have changed or disappeared 
in other Indo-European languages. For example, a recent dictionary published shows a stunning 108 words that are identical between both languages. Both Lithuanian and Slavic peoples have retained the same names for rivers, for example, as Sanskrit. Even more importantly, most scholars and linguists tend to rank Lithuanian, due to its conservative and unchanging nature, as quite probably the most similar still extant language to the Proto-Indo-European root, the seed, or tree trunk, that lies at the center of the multitude of linguistic branches now spread across the world. Most scholars seem to agree that the closest relatives of our ancient Proto-Indo-European root tongue are Lithuanian, Sanskrit, Ancient Greek, Latin, Gothic, and Old Irish, with perhaps an honorable mention to Old Church Slavonic, Avestan, and Tocharian. If we consider the geographical range covered by these thicker branches of this singular root, this hyper-diffusionist frame should start to make some sense. In my own personal opinion, it's simply undeniable. Looking at the word Aryan itself is, I believe, a fascinating glimpse into this interconnectedness. In large part because it was almost certainly the racial or ethnic designation used by this subset that would later go on to spread so far and wide. Its cognate in Proto-Indo-European was heros, or herios, which initially simply meant kinsman, or member of one's own group, but would of course go on to evolve into a term of great respect and admiration in our modern hero for an exceptional or courageous individual. Arya, or Aryan, also most frequently meant noble, or esteemed, or distinguished, or even best but would go on to mean lord or ruler or master, likely, because as the Aryan people spread far and wide, they traditionally took up positions of great power and influence, including in lands in which they weren't the majority population at times. The Luwians, who lived around the region of ancient Troy, seemed to be an early example of this, and the Mitanni seemed to be another. And in fact, a treatise that uses Sanskrit words was discovered in the archives of the Hittite capital of Bogaz Kui. Excavations in El Marna in Egypt have yielded the fact that about the middle of the second millennium BC, kings and princes with typical Vedic names were ruling in the region of modern-day Syria. Tutmos IV married a daughter of Artakma, who was the king of the Mitanni kingdom in the upper Euphrates River area. And during this time in Egyptian history, the ruling aristocracy of Egypt seemed to be of mixed Egyptian and Mitanni ancestry. The ethnic and cultural overlap of peoples stretching from Egypt and the Levant through Sumer and into ancient India and Persia was immense in ancient times. The pioneering Scottish polymath scholar professor and explorer Lawrence Austin Waddell, thought to possibly be the inspiration behind the Indiana Jones figure, and famous for his theory that Sumer, Egypt, India, and Persia were essentially something of a singular empire across vast stretches of the most ancient period of recorded history, even believed the Sumerians, or perhaps at least a ruling caste in Sumeria, spoke Sanskrit and his evidence that the king's lists published by these people groups are actually different variations of the same list with the same individuals listed is a fascinating possibility to consider. Waddell, in his work Makers of Civilization in Race and History, claims that Sargon the Great and Menes both repeatedly call themselves in surviving documents, Gut or Gat, and he believes this, much like the people group referenced by the Sumerians as the Guti, were the same people who would later come to be known as the Goths. And he tells us, quote, And significantly, the princes of this Gothic dynasty over 43 centuries ago already use, as we shall see, the especially Gothic titles of Duke and Earl. Waddell goes on to state, quote, 
Thus, the real date for the first Aryan or Sumerian kings becomes about 3378 BC, and the real date of Menes, the founder of the first dynasty of Egypt, becomes about 2703 BC. He continues, quote, A vast deal of what has hitherto been looked upon as prehistoric and mythical becomes historic and real. Heroes who have been raised into gods again take form as men, and as historic early Aryan kings of relatively fixed dates. Gods and demigods of the ancient Greeks and Romans, Egyptians and Hittites, Persians and Indo-Aryans, as well as of the Goths, Scandinavians and Germans, ancient Britons, Irish and Anglo-Saxons, such as Zeus, Jove, Jupiter, Indra, Prometheus, Atmu, Adamu, Adam, Ad, or Odin. Waddell continues, quote, On comparing these early kings' lists with those of the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, I observed that the latter documents also recorded in the self-same chronological position the dynasty of King Jin, or Guni, or Sargon the Great, bearing substantially the same names and titles in the Indian lists and in the exact same order, and that the names and order from Sargon's son Manus onwards were identical with those of Menes dynasty of pharaohs on their own Egyptian monuments. Menes, or Manj, in his Egyptian inscriptions, usually bears the title of Manj the warrior, and in the Sumerian king's lists and in his own inscriptions in Mesopotamia, the son and successor of Sargon the Great is styled as Manus the warrior, and the last king of this dynasty, bearing the same name in both Sumerian and Egyptian inscriptions, has his name significantly written on his own Egyptian inscription by the self-same Sumerian pictographic signs as in the Sumerian king's lists, and in his own inscriptions as Sumerian emperor in Mesopotamia." End quote. It should also be noted that one of the most common myths, legends, or historical accounts of prior ages is that of a garden paradise of sorts, a land of milk and honey, in which a population lived at peace and in great harmony and order and tranquility, surrounded by plenty. This theme is found in several traditions, and in the biblical tradition, the original garden paradise is called Eden and the Sumerian term for a plain or steppe just so happens to be Eden, similar to the spelling of the Scottish Edinburgh. Is there a definitive connection here? It's hard to say, but considering how central Sumeria was with regard to the earliest explosion of, quote, civilization, it shouldn't be so easily dismissed. If what Waddell implies is true, even partially so, it changes our entire understanding of history completely and forces us to see things through a new framework. Though importantly, when I cite Waddell or similar figures, I don't mean to insinuate that I agree with his every claim, but what's so frustrating about modern scholarship is that it's become so incredibly dogmatic, so reflexively defensive, that they'll pore over the work of a pioneering thinker like Waddell, the broader picture he so clearly paints and points to, and the hundreds of fascinating possibilities he brings to the table as possible proofs. They'll then find the one or two technicalities they feel they can most convincingly argue against, laser focus on these, and then treat the entire issue as if dealt with, as if they'd completely debunked the broader narrative or storyline by disproving, to their liking, some narrow claim or singular element within it. But this isn't how things work, of course. To give a quick example, if a detective comes to me offering 100 proofs that a man is behind a given murder, and I manage to disprove one or two of these 100 proofs, I have not destroyed his case by doing so. The burden of proof, to some degree, is still on me to provide compelling reasons and or a more compelling case to dismiss the broader claim. Figures like Waddell are so valuable because he provides such a mass of incredibly intriguing proofs 
each single one of which seems immensely valuable to any open-minded individual seeking to get at the truth of the matter. Approaching these things, as many present academics seem to do, as if one is a lawyer arguing for or against a given position, is absolutely not the ideal, and it seems the incentive and disincentive structures built into modern academia cultivate precisely this lawyerly and dogmatic behavior, and thus essentially churn out defense attorneys for the most conventional, status quo, politically correct, or socially acceptable narratives. Dogmatic and partisan, lawyerly approaches aren't conducive to uncovering historical truth, to put it mildly. Especially when all of these, quote, lawyers are on a single side of the ideological fence. And it should be added that Waddell was not only a respected scholar and professor, but one of the first men to actually spend time in these regions, like India and Tibet, for example, to meet and talk to people, to learn their spoken languages, and to decipher their written languages. I've long felt that a multidisciplinary skill set and approach is absolutely crucial if we ever hope to truly unravel these mysteries and understand our past, because developing a broader context picture is a must. It's been disappointing, but not the least bit surprising, to see that not only do modern scholars disagree with the man, but that they don't even bother to offer counters to his opinions, and instead don't dare mention his name or his ideas anymore. Acting as if this man who was once the foremost scholar of the history of the region never existed. If we are operating under the theory that the simplest explanation is most likely to be the correct one, the idea of a relatively singular people lying at the root of so many incredibly similar cultures, languages, and civilizations makes far, far more sense, to my mind, than the idea of all of these peoples emerging relatively independently, with such similar myths and legends and traditions, such similar languages and cultures. And this simplest explanation is the one that doesn't require that we throw out such a vast number of ancient historical accounts in favor of modern speculations and derivative accounts, and what seems to be highly partisan and dogmatic reinterpretations. When modern scholars claim that the Goths originated in Sweden, for example, fair enough, they've certainly had a long-standing connection to Sweden, but what do they mean by originated? Did they spring from the soil, fully formed? This doesn't happen, of course. So, where were they before this, for example? And why aren't we all more curious? Next, let's briefly discuss spiritual conceptions, which segue nicely from the topic of language. Virtually everywhere we look, amongst ancient cultures and histories, we'll find the concept of the All-Father, in Vedic, Dios Pitur, in Greek, Zeus Pitar, in Roman, it was Jupiter, Anu in the Sumerian tradition may be a variant of these. It's my opinion that the numerous instances of sun worship are related to this idea. Although worship is a tricky word here, I don't think they were actually seeing this materially existing fiery ball as the sum total of God, but rather the clearest manifestation of his light and power and creative and nurturing energy in our material realm. Ancestor worship and the worshiping of archetypal deities has always made perfect sense to me in this same regard. Again, the term worship shouldn't convey images of people devotedly believing that these ancestors or these archetypal gods were the end-all be-all of creation or the singular creative force behind it all. But it's all important to understand that the concept of a god that flows and courses through all creation and in a sense is all creation is impossible for our minds to fully and rationally grasp. It's a bit like looking at a pure white light, completely lacking in any differentiation or contrast. Our minds need individuation. We need things to grasp. If we added some black 
we might create something of a yin and yang differentiation, and immediately things can become clearly recognizable. Or, if you separate this white light into primary colors, these are things we can easily and readily understand and grasp. And perhaps, if we were able to honor each primary color in precisely equal measure in this analogy, and as derivatives and outgrowths of the one pure white light, we'd achieve a slightly better holistic understanding of our Creator, whose total nature defies language and defies perfect conscious understanding. The danger, of course, is in taking any one of these colors as the God of all, or taking any singular archetypal concept as the utmost. In my belief, this leads to disjointed and asymmetrical thinking, and thus disjointed and unbalanced being, and causes us to stray from the center point. It does seem to me that the further back we look, the more we find evidence of a singular conception of God the Father, or an All-Father, or an All-Feeder, at the root. The Zoroastrian tradition in Persia clearly speaks to this. Works like the Bhagavad Gita masterfully speak to the singular nature of God. The later Germanic peoples speak of an All-Father, just as the Oralinda book speaks of Ralda. Jesus speaks of his Father. Even Buddhism, in speaking of Dharma, recognizes a singular, all-pervasive law and a singular order behind all things. I've come to believe that a great deal of these now varied beliefs ultimately emerge from a single root. And just like the variety of cultures and languages that arose due to time and geographical separation, differences in understanding and interpretation of belief arose similarly. Dr. Churchward, in Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man, holds that the ancient Druids, quote, were undoubtedly descendants of the ancient Egyptian priests, who came over and landed in Ireland and the west of England, and who brought with them their religious doctrines and taught and practiced them here. The Tuatha Dé Danann, the princes or descendants of Diatinion, the fire god, or the sun, who came to Ireland, were of the same race and spoke the same language as the Firbolgs, or the Fomerians, possessed ships, knew the art of navigation, had a compass or magnetic needle, worked in metals, had a large army thoroughly organized, a body of surgeons, and a bardic or druid class of priests. These druids brought all their learning with them, believed and practiced the eschatology of the solar doctrines, and came from Egypt." End quote. The connection and overlap between Druid, Bard, Essene, and Magi, even Pythagorean and Zoroastrian, is extensive. Again, seemingly testifying to a great deal of interconnection across a vast territory. And the connection of the Celts to ancient Egypt also seems extensive and formerly well documented. As wild as this may sound to the modern ear, this was a topic much more casually discussed by historians of prior eras. It's unfortunate that I don't know quite enough about languages and the broader field of linguistics to make more definitive determinations with regard to etymological connections here, but I find it fascinating that so many ancient works, especially dealing with spiritual matters, speak of the waters or the breath of God that moves through all things. Lawrence Waddell even speaks of whom he believes to be the first ever Aryan king as having the royal title of, quote, bestower of the waters of life. The Oralinda book speaks of Iwa. The fascinating Colbrin Bible speaks of Awen. The ancient Germans had a term called Aiwi, and forgive my pronunciations, meaning vital force or life. This is also said to be the language root of the prefix ae, as in Aesir, or as used as part of ancient Germanic names 
like Athelred or Athelbald, which essentially marked them out as nobility. There also seems to be a strong connection between names like Adele or Adel, and names beginning with ATL or ATH. These are said to indicate nobility, but also, according to many accounts, to signify a quote, covenant. Names like Athena or Athens, Atheric, Athelstan, a naming convention as commonly used by the Goths as it seems to have been by the Frians or Frisians, and later Anglo-Saxons. There may well be an indirect connection to Atlantis buried here, as well as a connection to the ATL naming device as used by the ancient South American peoples, as exemplified by their bearded and fair-skinned civilization-bestowing god Quetzalcoatl who was said to have arrived from the ocean on a craft resembling dragons or snakes, which, of course, might bring to mind Phoenician and Viking ship designs. These connections may sound a bit wild to some on their face, but from the perspective of the larger context picture, I assure you they seem anything but. I've long been fascinated with both AE and ATL when used in names, of either individuals or places. It seems to simultaneously have a strong connection to both physical water and a spiritual conception of waters and the gods and the nobility. And to return to the idea of the Esir for a moment, many have speculated that this may have a direct connection to the modern name Azerbaijan as this region certainly correlates with where these gods, or illustrious men, were meant to have once resided. AES, or ESE, is the root of how Germanic peoples, and even Old English, referred to God, or the plural god-men, perhaps, who may well have been ancestors. I've long found it interesting that the Essenes, said by many to have been the oldest priesthood in the world, around since, quote, time immemorial, bear such a close etymological resemblance to this Esse. And it's said that both terms may have been influenced by the Proto-Indo-European root, and pardon my pronunciation here, we're no longer certain how this word sounded, but Eju, which means life force or spirit. Next, I'd like to speak to another controversial subject, made controversial post-World War II because hyper-diffusionist and thus politically incorrect. In all of my years pouring through historical accounts, I've come across what I feel is overwhelming evidence of an ancient aristocratic caste that seemed to have been accepted as the rightful rulers and governors of the broader Aryan people groups and even many peoples of different backgrounds in exceptional cases. And it's deeply interesting how interconnected these two terms, aristocracy and Aryan, seem to be. This lineage would go on to spread across vast distances, peoples and cultures, with the march of time, but we constantly find it being recognized by populations and nations, and touted by those who possessed it across virtually all histories. Zoroastrian scholar Farhang Mir puts it this way in speaking to ancient Persian Aryan practices. Quote, Implicit in the references to ancient Aryans in the literature is the development and establishment of a national governance through the establishment of a hereditary kingship and a royal line. In this system of governance, Aryan kings had a sacred responsibility to protect the people, establish and uphold the law, encourage human development, and lead the progress of society to a better life. When Aryan kings maintained this sacred trust and ethical compact, what in modern days we call a social contract, they were said to rule in grace in keeping with their kverina. The contrast between the attempt at wholly benevolent rulership so frequently found in Aryan peoples and cultures relative to and contrasted with figures like Nimrod, or Ninus, or the traditional conception of the tyrannical Asiatic ruler, is certainly a stark one. The latter is ravenous, parasitic, insatiable, 
and seemingly wholly self-interested. The former, in its ideal, was intended to see himself as something of the father of a household, or nation, or his people, and his success was their success. This is highly speculative, admittedly, and a product of educated guesswork and intuition based on an attempted summary and distillation of the many accounts I've been able to find and read over the years. But I feel like I've seen evidence that this lineage split into two major groups, as I've hinted at in past videos, which might be represented by a wagon wheel on one hand and a ship's helm or wheel on another because one group was one that we might call essentially land-based, and perhaps best represented by Royal Scythian, or lineages like the Gothic Amal or Balthi ruling lines, and the other, sometimes referred to as Sea Kings, whose genetic lineage we almost certainly have evidence of today in the R1B U106 haplogroup. And this latter group opens up a fascinating chapter of history, those peoples we've come to lazily refer to as Phoenicians, as an all-too-broad blanket descriptor, the earliest manifestations of whom were almost beyond any shadow of a doubt of R1B lineage, and have a strong connection to those peoples we call Celtic today, but perhaps equally strong to this R1B U106 lineage, which most consider Germanic in contrast to its being Celtic but in my view, it may well be both. This is one of the many reasons I took the Oralinda book so seriously, and still do, as it seemed to tally so clearly with what I'd long assumed to be the case, and helped fill something of a historical void and black hole with regard to peoples whose history almost seems to have been erased to some degree. Ancient Athens, especially in Hellenic and pre-Hellenic times, seems to have been very clearly one of the ancient epicenters of this seagoing aristocracy, which is yet another thing that may lend further credence to the Orlinda, as well as the fact that the final, or present-day, epicenter of this R1B U106 lineage seems to essentially be in, or near, modern Friesland, and may well represent the people group that provided the seed population that helped launch the vast ocean-going trade empires of both the English and the Dutch, and correlated seemingly so heavily with the ocean and coastal mastery of the Norse and Vikings. But to avoid too much digression, I'd like to discuss the wealth of histories that tie the most ancient form of those peoples we've come to call Celts to Anatolia, Phoenicia, Egypt, and this broader surrounding region. And there are many. What seems to occur more often than not is that these will be dealt with one by one by academics, in isolation from the broader context picture, and dismissed by these modern scholars as wild and fanciful. But this becomes much, much harder to do when you see how many varied accounts there are and how these accounts don't seem fabulous in the least in their totality, but rather matter-of-fact, and how so many of these seem to speak of several different facets of this Celtic and ancient Phoenician connection, indicating that they can't all spring from one root lie or misunderstanding or exaggeration. Again, calling it a Celtic-Phoenician connection may be a misnomer, as these ancient mariners seemed to possess R1B elements that seamlessly straddled the line between both Celtic and Germanic, and so often the more ancient separation between these two peoples can seem a bit forced and artificial. But perhaps calling this lineage majority Celtic and minority Germanic might be fair. After all, the number of descendants that spring from R1B U106 specifically are certainly vastly outnumbered by their descendants from much larger R1B families. And yet, wherever U106 roamed in particular, power and success, and seemingly a high level of general competence, seemed to follow. The Phoenicians, or those we've chosen to lump under the umbrella of Phoenicians, are easily one of the most important and fascinating keys to our collective history and I've come to believe strongly that they were initially, and yet didn't remain, 
a singular and relatively homogeneous people group, either ethnically or culturally speaking, but rather picked up a very foreign element along the way, and thus gradually became something very different over time as a result. Interestingly, the Ora Linda speaks of Phoenicia being used almost as a deportation area and as a refuge for their criminals and castoffs. And rather matter-of-factly, in speaking of the slightly later Phoenicians, calls them a, quote, bastard race. And it's mentioned openly, in more than one account, that the Phoenicians picked up the practice of slavery at some point, and subsequently began freely mixing with the peoples they'd enslaved, which may help explain this. Even as early as Homer's time, the description of some Phoenicians with darker skin, or hooked noses, seemed common. But it's likely the vastness of their trade routes that best explain this phenomenon. In the course of their mercantile operations, they'd have encountered a multitude of different peoples and cultures, and likely even acted as the vehicle for their movement to distant locations, more often than not. It's simply inevitable in a case like that of the Phoenicians, in which they traveled and traded and mingled so far and wide, that if such a people don't have an extremely strict or disciplined code of conduct, or powerful and deeply rooted cultural traditions, they're simply bound to degenerate, and to eventually come to serve money and personal gain above all else. And thus, to gradually watch their culture disappear, and morph into something very different, and, I would suggest, very hollow. It's said the Greeks began to use the term Phoenician for anyone that manipulatively engaged in, quote, sharp dealing or deceptive practices. Late Carthage, for example, has come to be known largely for its perfidy, its child sacrifice, and its almost complete lack of art, of high culture, of martial prowess, and of general grace and refinement. An unnatural hodgepodge nation that would gradually come to be dominated and controlled by a merchant class oligarchy, which the Romans finally and mercifully would eventually put out of the misery. A great deal of valuable research has finally seen the light of day just before the publishing of this video throwing significant weight behind the theory of an exceedingly strong connection between modern Europeans and an Indo-European past, helping liberate our history from the tiny pockets of heavily forested Europe so many modern academics seemed intent on wholly confining it to. The bulk of the latest findings center around the all-important Yamnaya, from whom the corded ware seemed to largely descend, and who might be said to be one of the best labels or definitions of the core of this Indo-European people, whom we formerly called Aryan prior to World War II, making it so dangerously unfashionable. Regardless of where one falls on the countless specifics of this story that remain to be definitively determined, I believe we're finally at the point in which the broader strokes can be voiced with some confidence. As historian Will Durant well phrased it in speaking of the Indian branch of the Aryans, quote, the invasion and conquest of these tribes by the Aryans was part of that ancient process whereby periodically the North has swept down violently upon the settled and pacified South. This has been one of the main streams of history on which civilizations have risen and fallen like epical undulations. The Aryans poured down on the Dravidians, the Achaeans and Dorians upon the Cretans and Aegeans, the Germans upon the Romans, the Lombards upon the Italians, the English upon the world. Forever, the North produces rulers and warriors. The South produces artists and saints." End quote. It's certainly true that one of the most obvious themes running through the entirety of the ancient historical record is that of a people to the north, full of energy and vitality, and impressive competence and ability, going where they pleased, when they pleased, and either felling or creating nations and empires in their wake. 
modern scholarship seems to be finally coming close to acknowledging this, however slowly and begrudgingly. But I think many are, even still, missing a key point. These warlike invaders are constantly portrayed as brutish and brutal, destroyers as opposed to creators, warriors but never cultivators or builders. I think this misses the idea that these waves of Indo-Europeans, emanating from what seems to have once been a central core, had been striking out into this great unknown for as long a period as we have any history of, and that there were countless such waves. In fact, these waves seemed to compound and build upon one another. In other words, an early wave might have pushed into an India or a Greece, only to then be followed a few hundred years later by yet another wave of genetic kin, yet of people whose culture may now appear more wild, untamed, even brutal, because the perspective of the more settled peoples of the earlier wave had gradually changed with time and a different mode of living. There's an absolutely fascinating domino effect created by these waves, which we might even say extended all the way to the time of Attila and Genghis Khan in some sense, as we'll cover in the next videos. A cyclical dance in which brother and cousin peoples cascade upon and push one another ever further, and expansion and population pressures gradually push this family across the majority of the known world. One thing is certain. The story of the Indo-European people, who almost certainly spring from a relatively singular root, not more than a mere five to six thousand years ago, perhaps after some massive cataclysm caused a major reset and major population bottlenecks, is perhaps the single most incredible, fascinating, powerful, and important story in human history. And it's a story that the vast majority of remains to be told. A story that only now we're beginning to pick up the traces of, to cobble the pieces together, and to formulate into some coherent narrative. It's safe to say that no family of peoples has been more consequential, more impactful, more adventurous and courageous and all-pervasive. It wasn't just the physical gifts of a larger stature that led to their success. These were true pioneers, inventors, and that uniquely curious and energetic type that always and everywhere pushes the envelope with a burning, innate, insatiable desire to explore, to understand, and in my opinion, to create what they saw as a just and natural order and the conditions for a longer term flourishing in their wake. In my opinion, we are collectively standing at the earliest stages of and taking our first steps toward piecing together what I believe may be the most interesting story in the world. And the more we come to understand here, the more we'll ultimately come to understand about ourselves, about our journey, our own character and wiring, our heritage, and perhaps even our very direction and purpose. As dark as things may seem right this moment, our journey is far from over. And, in fact, it may well be that we are just getting started. <laughs>